A Burn in Love? Because that's the song, yeah. I like the song. Oh, really? Uh huh. Punk of Chunk, Burn in Love? Something like that. Okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, stoichiometry is that crazy word that you might have heard from previous chemistry classes, like, this is so hard. Well, the good news is, you have done all the little pieces of stoichiometry already. You've done them all. What we need to do now is weave them all together. And it's actually, the math is actually not too difficult. If you're paying attention and you don't uh, take shortcuts and you follow my instructions, you're going to do very, very well. Now, we talked about back in September that if you master this one box T chart, then four or five box T chart, not that bad. Okay? Um, if you know how to drive one mile, you should be able to know how to drive five miles. And that's basically the crux of stoichiometry. We're going to take the mole ratios that we learned about when we were balancing chemical equations and the molar mass that we learned about when we were turning moles to grams back in September, and we're going to weave them together. Stoichiometry literally is the measure of stuff. And specifically, it's the calculation of how much you should make based on how much you use. Or, if you want to use up all of chemical A, this is how much of chemical B you're going to need. That's stoichiometry. If you're going to make chemical, if you have chemical A and chemical B, and you know their amounts, this is how much of chemical C you're going to make. At the conclusion of this unit, you're going to do a lab where you're going to measure out a bunch of chemicals, and then you're going to grind them together, and you're going to go outside, and you're going to light them on fire. And if you did your stoichiometry properly, it's going to go whoosh and make this big cloud of fire and smoke. And everyone's going to be like, ah, fire, oh no. If you didn't do it right, you're going to light on a fire, and it's going to go, it's just going to melt. And everyone's going to laugh at you. <laughs> Especially Quinn. He's laughing right now. He's already getting right. He's ready to go. I, I, are we doing I this today? myself to okay. get used to everyone. Question? Are we doing it today? No, in about three weeks. Oh. Yeah. This is our largest single unit of the whole year because this is really the bulk of chemistry. This is chemistry. This is you have recipe, you have chemicals, you slam the chemicals and recipe together, and you get a product. So the recipe is the balanced chemical equation, and we're going to use that to figure out if I have chemical A, this is how much of chemical B I'm going to need, and I should be able to use those things to make chemical C, this amount of chemical C. Okay. Other questions before we jump right in? Then let's go. Okay. Now here's the important thing about stoichiometry, one of the many important things. You're going to see things that look like fractions. They are not. They are conversions, not fractions. For instance, 12 donuts is one dozen. Okay. If I order 12 donuts, I'm going to get one dozen. One dozen is also 12 donuts. They're the same thing. And if you're driving down the road and it says 65 miles per hour, there's a little needle there, that means in one hour, you're going to drive 65 miles. Or if you've driven 65 miles, it's going to take you one hour. These are conversions, not fractions. Now, when you look at H2O, if you look at H2O, you realize that if you have two moles of H2O, you're going to have one mole of O2. This is called a mole ratio. Mole of something to mole of something. If I have two moles of O2, I can make one, sorry, if I have one mole of O2, I can make two moles of H2O. Give me a thumbs up if that idea makes sense. Some of you are getting there. Okay. On the periodic table, we use this conversion. This is a molar mass. And the periodic table tells us if I have one mole of O2 gas, that one mole is going to weigh 32 grams. Similarly, if I have 32 grams, I have one mole of O2. Okay. <coughs> Molar mass from the periodic table, mole ratio from the balanced chemical equation. That's basic stoichiometry. We're going to weave them together. Now, also unique to this unit, previously you've had uh, 
learning, practice, mini quiz, more practice, test. Now, you're going to have, in this unit, you're going to have learning, practice, quiz, practice, quiz, practice, quiz. Or actually, learning, practice, quiz, learning, practice, quiz, learning, practice, quiz, whole bunch of practice, unit test. There's going to be three or four quizzes in this unit, little quizzes. So we can use them as benchmarks to figure out, have we mastered each part of stoichiometry? Because there's really, there's three parts of stoichiometry. There's the basic stoichiometry we're going to learn this week. There's what's called limiting reactant that we're going to learn the following week. And then there's thing called percent yield that we're going to learn the last week. Yeah, we're going to be in stoichiometry for a while. But don't fret. It's actually a lot of fun. And it's actually really neat. And the math is not that bad. If you understand this from September, then this will be easy. OK. Any questions? So what do we do in stoichiometry? Specifically, we take the moles of A, this is chemical A, and we convert it to mass of A, just like we did in September with the periodic table. We said, I have this many moles. I want to, I want to find out how many grams that is. We use a single t-chart, and we find out how many grams that many moles of chemical A is. We can also go back the other way. We could go grams to moles. One of the last things we're going to be doing is we're going to learn about gas density. And gas density is taking the grams of a chemical and finding out its volume. How many liters does it occupy? We're going to learn how to that, do that as well. And that just That's also a one-step feature. Grams of hydrogen gas to liters of hydrogen gas. We've done this before. Converted moles to molecules. That's also a one-step t-chart. A mole of something to molecules of something. If I have a mole of carbon atoms, I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules or atoms of carbon atoms. So we've done this before. One mole is 6.02 things. One mole of puppies is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things of puppies? Of puppies? That would be a lot of puppies. If you're curious about uh, what that would look like, XKCD has a good treatment of what would a mole of animals do to the world? You should check it out. YouTube for XKCD. Okay, this is probably well, we've done this before, but not in practical application. We've looked at the mole ratio when we balance chemical equations. We wrote the balanced chemical equation. We said, oh, for every one mole of iron oxide, I get two moles of iron and three moles of oxygen. Or for every one mole of sulfuric acid, I have two moles of hydrogen, one mole of sulfur, four moles of oxygen. We've done this with the balanced chemical equation. Now we're going to use it as a tool. Now, this is the heart of stoichiometry. When you take mass of one thing, or moles of one thing, and you turn it into mass of something else. That's the heart of stoichiometry. Mass of chemical A, how much of chemical B do I need? Or Mass of chemical A, how much of chemical B will I make? That's the heart of stoichiometry. And this is also why I, I had you learn the T-chart back in September. If you learn the T-chart back in September, or learned at any point so far, then it's just like plugging Legos onto a block. If you know how to plug in one Lego, then plugging in five Legos is pretty, it's just more work, but it's not more challenging. Same logic. <coughs> and then lastly, we're going to learn something called percent yield. Percent yield has to do with what's called an ideal condition versus a real condition. Yeah, I know the colors are going to be a little weird because, meh. So 
If you can't see something, please ask. I'll let you know. No. Sometimes colors get a little washed out with the projector we got. Ready to jump right in? Boom. Okay. T charts. So remind ourselves how we make how what how what T charts are used for. When we're doing a conversion of any kind, we're going to use a T chart. So the first thing we do is we write our T. Now previously, we've made our T like a plus sign. Now we're going to make it like a sword, because we're going to need some other blocks. Okay. So September, it was a plus sign. And January and February, it's a sword. What goes in the, what goes in the top box up here? Our starting thing. Our starting number and unit are the given number or in unit. What goes in the bottom box down here? Nothing! Yay! Nothing goes down there. Nothing goes here. Nothing goes there. Here we go. You ready for something really, really important? Yes. Three things go in each box. Three things go in each box. How many things go in each box? Three. Three. Three things go in each box. A number, a unit, and a chemical. Three things go into each box. A number, a unit, and a chemical. So you would write something like 25 grams of CO2. 2.3 moles of HCl. You might write 5.3 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of nickel. Three things go into each box. Now, the students who have trouble with stoichiometry are the ones who blatantly refuse to follow this rule. I'm not doing this because I want you to have more work. I'm telling you to do this because shortcuts don't work in stoichiometry. Don't try to save two seconds and not write the unit. Don't try to save two seconds and not write the chemical. Shortcuts don't work. So, how many things go in each box? Three. Three is the proper number of things in each box, and the number of things in each box shall be three. Four? is too much, five is right off. Thou shalt not put two boxes, two things in a box, until unless you're about to add a third. Three is the proper number of things in each box. And the proper number of things in each box is three. Yes? Three. OK, so now the reason I mention this is every year, somebody comes to me and says, I don't understand this stoichiometry thing. So I say, well, let's work this one out. And what do they do? They only write the numbers. They don't write the units and the chemicals. This is the single biggest pitfall. I realize in math, they just have you write a bunch of numbers. Well, in science, you need to write the unit and the label. Three, tres, dry, trois. OK, so without further ado, Give me a thumbs up if this makes sense. OK, cool. So once we've written our starting unit chemical and number up here, we bring down something. What do we bring down? The 
unit and the chemical. We only bring down the unit label. We never bring down the numbers. So bring down the unit and the chemical, but not the number. Because that's what we're going to cancel out to convert. Now I've got a little um, fun recipe here. Uh, this is a part of a recipe, my theoretical biscuit recipe. So if a recipe requires four eggs for each batch of 20 biscuits, how many dozens of eggs do you need to buy to make 180 biscuits? So let's do this. What is my given unit? The, the number that has no conversion. What's my given unit? A bunch of numbers are up there that are conversions, but I want a number that doesn't have a, my given unit is the one that doesn't have a conversion, or that, that isn't a conversion. 180 biscuits, right. So 180 biscuits. Now if this is chemical, it would be grams of biscuits, or moles of biscuits. In this case, 180 biscuits. That's my starting number. Because it doesn't say 180 biscuits equals something. It does tell us that 4 eggs equals 20 biscuits, and we know that 12 eggs equals 1 dozen. So uh, we're starting with 180 biscuits. What's my next step? Bring down my biscuits. I brought down my biscuits because I want my biscuits to cancel out. I want my biscuit unit to cancel out. So I brought down my biscuits. What am I converting to from biscuits to what? Eggs. Good. Because I have a conversion from biscuits to eggs. What is that conversion? Four eggs to 20 biscuits. For every four eggs I use, I'm going to make 20 biscuits. Biscuits is a fun word to say. Biscuits. Okay. Now, am I done? No. No. I need to cancel out my biscuits because just like you know, you know how we love canceling things out? Yes. When you have an X on top and an X down below, you have to cancel things out. Well, if you have a unit up top that matches the unit down below, they should cancel out. They should always cancel out like this. Upper left, lower right. Upper left, lower right. So cancel out biscuits. Now my unit is eggs. Is that what I'm going to go to the store to buy? I'm buying dozens. So I need another conversion. Another box. Make another box. I bring down, bring down my eggs. And now I'm converting to dozens. Dozens. Slide, slide, slide. So ordinarily, unless you go to a wonky grocery store, how many eggs are in one dozen? Twelve. Twelve. Cross out my eggs. Cross out my eggs. Now I have the unit I want, and I can do math. Yes. Now you actually have a a function or a complex fraction. Now you have 180 times 4 divided by 20 times 12. And that's going to be how many dozens I need to purchase at the grocery vendor. Yeah, on uh, on Wednesday. We're going to learn about mole mole. I'm kind of planting a seed. Yeah. We're going to learn mole mole today. Then we're going to do a mole simulation on Tuesday. And then we'll learn mass mass, which is the bulk of stoichiometry on, uh, on Wednesday. OK, ladies and gentlemen, there's a pitfall here. There's a pitfall. 
and I'm going to mention it because it's important. Because it's important. Your calculator is good at working and bad at thinking. This math is 180 times 4 divided by 20 times 12 in parentheses. It is not 180 times 4 divided by 20 times 12. Exactly. You get way too many eggs. 432 eggs is way too many eggs. It's not that. It's also, if you want to do it my way, it's 180 times 4 divided by 20 divided by 12. You pick. Just as long as you check your math, be advised those fractions get a little crazy. So you can always check your work. Anytime you have an equal sign, check your work. If I was going to get a tattoo, it would be right here, and it says, check your work. So it's like, I didn't get this right. I'd stare at them with my tattoo. Okay. If you got three dozens, give me a thumbs up. Looks like most of you got a three dozen. Okay, cool. So what this means, guys, is this is the basis of stoichiometry. I want to make 180 things. I don't have, I can't go to the grocery store and say, I would like the number of eggs required to make 180 biscuits. They'd be like, I'm going to need some conversions. So you convert your biscuits to eggs and eggs to dozens, and you buy your dozens. Now, just like we use two steps, in stoichiometry, you just keep using steps until you get the unit you want. You have your unit, unit to convert. Unit, unit to convert. Unit, unit to convert, and so on until you have the unit you want. I apologize for the color. This says unit to convert, previous unit, unit to convert, previous unit, unit to convert. And you just keep going, whether it be one box, two box, three box, four box, or five boxes. You just keep going. One boxing, two boxing, five boxing. Five boxing is probably about as much as you're going to do. You can do a ten boxing, but. You're going to do way more math than you need. OK, so this is science, not math. So wait to do the math at the end. Uh, I don't know how they're going to teach you to do in math. Like, do math every step. No. In, in chemistry, you wait till the very, very, very end to do your math. It's just better that way. Wait until you have your goal unit before you do any math. Don't carry down numbers. Only carry down units with their chemicals. And check your math. Check your math. I gave you a whole number in my sample exercise because if you go to the grocery store and try to order or try to buy 3.2 dozens, they'll pat you on the head and say, that's cute, you have to buy them. So you, normally, yeah, normally you'll get um, numbers with decimals, sometimes exponents. Okay, I do have to mention this one, one more thing before we move on. If you were to weigh all of the flour and sugar and oil and eggs, and water, and chocolate chips before you made chocolate chip cookies, would they weigh the same as all the chocolate chip cookies that came out of the oven? No. We know this. In reality, what you actually get out of a system tends to not be what you've got put into the system. That is called a real reaction or a real condition. So some gets left on the spoon, some gets left in the bowl, Sometimes the cookies burn and turn into smoke. Sometimes your little brother eats the batter and gets salmonella. 
you know, whatever. Um, but the important thing is this, guys. Stoichiometry gives you the real, or sorry, gives you the ideal conditions. Stoichiometry will always give you the ideal conditions. If everything is perfect, this is what you're going to get. Stoichiometry always gives you ideal conditions. Okay? We will learn in a couple weeks what to do with real conditions. Just understand that stoichiometry always gives you the ideal conditions if everything is perfect. Shall we move on? Okay. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, we're going to convert from things like grams to grams. This is my model on actual stoichiometry. In basic stoichiometry, we want to convert from grams of A to grams of B. But there is no conversion that exists to go from grams of one thing to grams of another thing. The only way we can convert chemicals is through a mole ratio. Moles of A to moles of B. It's the only way. It's the translator, if you will. The only way we can translate from chemical A to chemical B is through a mole ratio. So if we have mass, we need to get our mass to what? moles. So if we have mass A, we must first convert to moles A. That allows us to use the mole ratio to convert to moles B, and then from moles B to grams B. Okay. One box, grams A. Next box, convert to moles A. Next box, convert to moles B. Next box, convert to grams B, and we have our answer. That's the geometry. The only way you can convert chemicals is with a mole ratio. Moles of one to moles of the other. Moles of A to moles of B. Moles of A to moles of B. You cannot convert chemicals any other way. It's the only way. So sometimes we'll start at moles of A and go to moles of B. And that's what we're doing today. Today we're just going to focus on the mole ratio. We're going from moles of A to moles of B. Tomorrow as well. And then after tomorrow, on Wednesday, then we'll look at the whole spectrum. Going from grams of A to moles of A to the mole ratio, to moles of B, down to grams of B. Okay. Let's remind ourselves the molar mass, though, because it's important. What do we use molar mass for? You use molar mass to take moles and turn it into grams, or take grams and turn it into moles. Okay. Remember on the periodic table, we see our molar mass, find it on the periodic table. That allows us to convert between mass to moles or moles to grams. Now, let's do some practice. You need a periodic table for this. What I would like you to do is use the periodic table, use the same skills we've learned and used numerous, time, numerous times to find what is the molar mass of each of these five things. I'm going to give you some time to work on that. What is the molar mass of each of these five things?
number of grams in one mole. Just like in this file, in this file I have one mole of copper. I know it's one mole of copper because I took a bunch of old pennies and I weighed out 63.5 grams. The molar mass of copper is 63.5 grams per mole. So 63.5 grams is one mole. Is that, is that all we do just to find the answer? Like yes. Just look at the periodic table. And there's a very important reason we're doing this. I want to show you something really important. Okay. Who can just throw out the molar mass of copper? Wait. What for what? What? 63.5 grams of copper is one mole of copper. This is the proper molar mass. 63.5 ga copper is one mole copper. That's the molar mass. Again, how many things go in each box? Three. Three. What about sodium? What's sodium's molar mass? How much? Okay, so Patrick says 23. Patrick says that one mole of sodium has a mass of 23 grams of sodium. One mole of sodium has a mass of 23 grams. Mr. Byers, you drew it upside down. Yeah. No, I didn't. Remember. These are not fractions. These are conversions. You can flip them upside down. It doesn't change them. Fractions, you flip them upside down, and you completely change the number. You've made it as reciprocal. Conversions, you can flip them upside down. It doesn't change the conversion. So you can write a molar mass as grams per mole, or you can write a molar mass as mole per gram. One mole of sodium is 23 grams of sodium. 63.5 grams of copper is one mole of copper. You can write it either way. Give me a thumbs up if that makes sense. Okay. Again, I'm giving you the tools. And we're going to use oxygen. What's oxygen? 32? So 32 grams of oxygen is one mole of oxygen. Yes, that's why it's 32, because it's O2. Thirty-two-ish. Sixteen each. Because it's one mole of O2. This is why we always write the chemical. Because if you said, what's the molar mass of oxygen? I'd be like, um, O or O2. Oxygen, the atom, is 16. Oxygen, the molecule, is 32. O is 16, O2 is 32. Ah. Okay. What's carbon dioxide? 44. If I have one mole of CO2, I have... If I have one mole of CO2, I have 44 grams of CO2. Pretend that's a 2. I'm not going to worry about the last one. So once again, the reason I brought this up is molar mass can be grams per mole or moles per gram. Capiche? Okay. Give me a thumbs up. You're ready to move on. All right. We're, not, we're just going to skip all the practice because you don't need it. Moles, moles. Okay. Now, this is what we're going to be working on today and tomorrow. It is the conversion of one mole of chemical A to one mole of chemical B, or so many moles of chemical A to so many moles of chemical B. And the only way to change chemicals is with the mole ratio. And the mole ratio comes from the balanced chemical equation. Are you ready for practice? Okay, here we go. How many moles of chlorine gas are required to make 3.4 moles of copper chloride? Wow, copper 2 chloride. Pretend there's a 2 right in the middle here. Pretend there's a 2 right there. Copper 2 chloride. 
So the first thing we need to do is realize if we have chlorine and copper, and we're going to make copper chloride, is our chemical reaction balanced? Yeah, right here it's balanced. So one molecule of copper and one molecule of chlorine Cl2 is going to give us one molecule of copper 2 chloride. So what this means is for every one mole of chlorine, we're going to need one mole of copper and we're going to produce one mole of CuCl2. We have a mole ratio of one mole of Cl2 to one mole of CuCl2. That's a mole ratio. Can we flip it upside down? Yes, we can. We can also flip it upside down. We can also write this, or one mole of CuCl2 is equivalent to one mole of Cl2. So in that case, we can actually do a mole-mole conversion. 3.4 moles of CuCl2, and we're going to convert it to moles of Cl2. So we bring down our mole CuCl2, we're going to convert to mole Cl2, that's going to give us our answer. What number goes in this box for chlorine? One mole of Cl2. What goes in this box for copper chloride? One mole of copper to chloride. So it's 3.4. We can do that math. 3.4 times 1 over 1. One times one divided by one is, hold on, let me get some scratch paper. Okay, does this idea make sense so far? Yes. Okay, now let's do one that isn't a one to one ratio anymore. Determine the moles of oxygen gas released by the decomposition of 5.6 moles of water. So we need to decompose water, right? So H2O, our favorite, decomposes into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, both diatomic. Sprinkle off. So H2O2. Is this a balanced chemical equation? No, it's not. So let's balance it. There is a scenario where we put a number here. What number should we put here? Two? What number should we put here? Two? What number should we put here? One. Okay, so let's check our work. Bouncing. Two by two is four hydrogens. Two by two is four hydrogens. Yeah? Two by one is two oxygens. One by two is two oxygens, and it's balanced. But the mole ratio now is important. The mole ratio of moles of O2 to moles of H2O is not one to one. What is it? Yep, one O2 to two H2O. The mole, the mole ratio is two H2O and one O2. One mole of O2 it's going to be equivalent to two moles of H2O. Two moles of H2O is equivalent to one mole of O2. What's next? Make a T-chart. Good. So make a T-chart. Our given unit is 5.6 moles O2. Thank, thank you. Moles of H2O. Where would I be without you guys? Keep making this. 
take all of this. So what do I do with my G-Turk? Now that I've got my starting unit. Bring down moles H2O, and we're going to convert to moles O2. Hopefully, everyone is getting this. Not just Carson and Chandler. Over in the corner. So, the mole of O2, what number should go in this box up here? One. What number should go here? Two. Two. And the number you're going to get is going to be mole O2. How are you feeling so far about the stoichiometry? Give me a thumbs up if you're you're getting it. This is making sense. All right, cool. It's a way. Yes. If they ask for hydrogen instead of oxygen, we use H2 instead. Uh huh. Yeah. If it asks for hydrogen instead of oxygen, we'd use H2, and the ratio would be two moles of H2O to two moles of H2. It'd be two to two instead of one to two. And is it ever going to ask for both? All the time, yeah. Okay, so we'll go ahead and call it a day there.